I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. Now I've got about 1% of vision left in my left eye and 3% in my right eye. The big wave surfing I do now, like it's, people can't work out how it's physically possible. Most people go, there's no fucking way I'm going in the wall. That's the wall zone. I love it. Having a disability, I wanted to be a pro surfer too and I thought that was never a possibility for me. But I've made that choice as a kid that I'm going to get on with things rather than sitting in the corner feeling sorry for myself. Biggest waves in the world there. Someone died six weeks after I was there. It's, it's a serious place. How big was it? Uh, it was about 55 feet. What the fuck? Four cameras on land, two cameras on jet skis in the water, three safety skis, two drones above me. No one could find me. Oh my God. When you were fully sighted, yeah. do you remember that period? No. My only memory is pre five years old here. It was on Christmas Eve and the dads all went outside and said, I wonder if we can see Santa in the sky. And we looked up and as we looked up, there was a, a shooting star or maybe it was Santa, I'm not sure, but it went, th <laughs> went through the sky. Superpower of empathy that you've built. Something that I'm passionate about is understanding people and being empathetic. And I think it comes back to me not being understood as a kid. So I realise how important it is to purely understand people and what their differences are. My mate, Mick, who I rode on a tandem with, is Matt's, Matt's whole life's just a 2 a.m. piss. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> Matt Formston, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Mark, thanks for having me. How you going, all right? Good, mate, really good. Uh, did you, when I took my shoes off a few minutes ago, could you smell my, my uh, uh, feet? I'm going to be polite and say no. Yeah, are fucking lying to me. <laughs> I can smell them. Yeah, so, no, I couldn't uh, smell them, mate. Oh, uh, well, because I, I actually, as soon as you walked in, I got very conscious of um, the fact that um, you are probably had to grow up all your life with and heightened senses, yeah. relatively speaking, yeah. relative to, say, someone who's not, who has full sight, for example. Um, yeah. Is that is that a thing? Like, is that real, a it's real thing? It's not a thing. It, what it is, is you learn to use the information better. So you'd, your sense, ah, everyone's got the same senses. It's just that the way you interpret the information becomes more tuned in. That's interesting. So yeah. tell me what it is that you were afflicted with. I mean, I got on here, it's it's called like macular dystrophy. Yes. What, what, what is that? Uh, so the macula is a part of the eye. So the, the, most people will have heard of the retina, which is the part yep. that's the back of your eye. The macula is a, is a small part of the retina and it, it basically it's in charge of, of focusing and mainly central vision. Um, but it's essentially part of how your eye works. Uh, and mine, if you look at a photo, so they've taken photos of the back of my eye and it looks like death. It looks like something out of a, like a zombie apocalypse movie. It's just all dead <laughs> tissue. Whereas a nice eye, a normal eye, your eye would look nice. It's like nice pink soft tissue. Mine's just all dead scarring and like lines and just, yeah, it's all dead. I hope my fucking eye looks like that. I mean, I'm not sure. <laughs> I've been punching that enough times for it might be, no, maybe it doesn't, but like, so, you, so, you were at five years of age diagnosed yeah, with this? Correct. Is it a disease? I mean, do you look at it like a disease? What do you think of it? Uh, yeah, it's word? a disease, a disorder. Um, I, yeah, it's a disease. Like it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's ill health, you know what I mean? So anything that's, that's, not, that's not optimal health or optimal for your body, I think, is a disease or some sort of disability. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's, it's very common in elderly people. So you will have heard of uh, macular degeneration. Yep. Uh, which affects actually one in seven adults over the age of 55. And I presume that means the macula is, has degenerated with age and doesn't do its job anymore. Correct. Well, it's starting to degenerate and we'll start getting that scarring. It won't be that nice soft pink tissue. It'll start degenerating and it will uh, start getting some form of damage. It can be managed though. So there's two forms, there's wet and dry, and that can be managed um, a lot better than when I, I basically my vision deteriorated over one year. So from the age of four where I was looking straight in the, like this camp, there's photos of me from uh, when I was four where I'm looking straight down the barrel of the camera, um, catching the ball, no problems, all that stuff. And then by the time I was five, I had to change the way I caught a ball because I, couldn't, I was sort of catching it last minute um, and I wasn't looking anywhere near the camera. I was looking everywhere else. Like if you're going to try and catch something, for example, yeah. a ball, um, you can't really focus on the ball. Uh, no, not at all. So I'm basically waiting for it to just hit me on the chest and then I react to catch it. Um, or sometimes I can see it last minute because it's, I can see I've got, well, I've, I've now got about 1% of my vision left in my left eye and 3% in my right eye. But when I was five, I, I, was, I was down to about 5%. You can see light. I mean, like, I can see light. Yeah. So, you know, like if you go outside out of the studio and it's yeah. a bright, bright sunny day, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can see light. I can see light, shadows, I can see color. 
Um, but a lot of the times, I mean, these days coming to Sydney is a nightmare for me because there's so much sound. I use sound to get around. I, I rode from, you know, I've set some world records in cycling and stuff and I do that through echolocation. I can hear the, the things around me, whereas when there's a saturation of sound, I can't hear anything. Or I can hear everything, but it doesn't give me a map because it's just over. It's overwhelming the amount of information. I mean, you've done some fucking crazy shit here, like uh, cycled, surfing. I, mean, I want to get into all that sort of stuff because... Yeah. Like, like I'm absolutely intrigued um, how you navigate, yeah. um, as you said right at the very beginning, yeah. to tap into the various senses we've all got, yeah. but we probably don't, not necessarily take for granted, but they all just you don't, work you don't need, of, you don't need to develop those skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, a bit, a bit, but you've made a conscious effort to do something, which is bloody mm, incredible. Not really, no. Nah. Didn't make you it. It, was, nah, it wasn't a conscious effort. It was just evolved. It was just an evolution because I had to. So my mates are doing something and I would just do it with them and I'd learn how to do it my way and they'd learn how to do it their way. When you were fully sighted? Yeah. Do you remember that period? No. No. No, my only memory, um, and you know, it's, we're talking pre five years old here. My only memory is, and I think it could be made up, you know, but it's a very clear memory in my in my head, but it was having a barbecue at a, uh, at a dad's mate's place down the road in our street and it was sort of dark and the that, dad's, it was on Christmas Eve and the dad's all went outside and said, I wonder if we can see Santa in the sky. And we looked up and as we looked up, there was a, um, I just remember seeing so many millions, like really fine um just how much detail there was in the stars and everything. And then a, a shooting star, or maybe it was Santa, I'm not sure, but went, th <laughs> went through the sky. Uh, and I remember that vision really clearly, but everything else I don't really have any any clarity of, of, of any visions. Or, of, you know, I can't see my kids' faces really that well, and I can sort of map them out and I feel them, and I've got a bit of – they can use a bit of sight and a, a lot of feel to work out what I think they look like. But, um, yeah, lots of things in my life I've just never been able to see. So what, what does that mean in terms of memory then? Like, uh, so – My memory is very visual. Yeah. Well, okay. Can you explain it to me? Like, uh... so everything's a map to me. So I can walk into a bar that I went to in Italy six years ago that I went to once, and I could give you a map. Once we walk in, I can say the bar, the the, to the toilet is at the back, and if they've kept the seating arrangement the same, I remember exactly how the seating arrangement is. So it's a visual map in my head of how everything is. But it's more a, a graphic design, so to speak. You wouldn't remember there was a curb on the chair or something no, like no, that. No, no, no. It's just that I know it's step. It's like a, a step by step. Of you go like it's going to be it's eight steps down that straight ahead, and then two steps to the right for the ninety degree turn, or it might be a forty five degree because there's something else there. So I remember the angles, and it's like a it's a it's a mind map of how to get around the whole world basically. But are you continually continually doing that, drawing maps in your mind? Yes, but it's not conscious. I'm not consciously going. I need to remember where this toilet is in Italy. I just do it, and my brain maps it for me because it needs to. Because I've had, because I've made that choice, you know, because I've made that choice as a kid that I'm going to get on with things rather than sitting in the corner feeling sorry for myself, or going, I need everyone to help me. It's very fiercely independent, you know, to my own detriment a lot of times. Um, so I've made myself learn these things, and then now my body has a way of capturing that information and storing it for me. It's funny, you know, and I don't want to be uh, trivialised what we're talking about, but last night I got got up middle night take a piss because I'm at that age. Yeah, uh, when you get up a few times, yeah, and. Yeah. Uh, it was nighttime, so it was dark. Yeah. And uh, I thought, I'm not going to turn the light on yeah. uh, because it might wake me up. Yeah. Because, you know, light apparently does it. I know so, where you're going with this, and I've got a really funny story about this. Keep and going. I thought, yeah. well, I'll yeah. just, and I was walking down the hallway. Yeah. And uh, I thought, I'll count the steps. Yeah. How many steps it is to the toilet. Yeah. And just, I'm, I'm playing, playing and having a bit of fun with myself. And I just yeah. put my arms out to feel where the wall was. Yeah. And I actually kept my eyes closed on purpose. Yeah. yeah. But it was a, uh, a conscious effort by me, yeah. Whereas you're saying what you've done in the past, you know, give me that example, yeah. the Italian yeah. bar restaurant. Yeah. That's an unconscious one, or maybe subconscious, or whatever the yeah. word so is. So I'm, I'm not counting the steps. My, it's just I know my body just knows that okay, you got to turn right now. I've, there's no counting. There's no conscious counting going on. As you're saying that about the toilet, like I know I can walk at any part of my house. I can walk and put my hand up, and I know that I'm going to touch that part of the wall. Wow. Um, but it's funny because my mate Mick, who I rode on a tandem with, and we won gold medals all over the world together. Spent way too much time in hotel rooms, uh, more time with each other than our wives at the time. And he's, I'm making, a, we've just made a movie about my life and big wave surfing, which comes out in February. And it, I've seen, the, I've seen like the, the first cut of it. And Mick's in it. He's probably the, the and his part in it. He says, and he because he obviously has been around me a lot. And he goes, Matt, like we all go to the toilet. You go to the toilet at two a.m. And you get to the toilet and you don't, you know, you don't fall over and you, you do a piss, piss and you, you don't, you do a piss here and you get back to the toilet, you get back to the bed, whatever. Because Matt's, Matt's whole life is just a 2am piss. 
Hey, are you serious? Yeah, that's what he says in the movie. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just let's just okay. Let's just talk about Matt growing up. Yeah. yeah. Um. So here you are. You know, you're a five year old kid. Yeah. And you get this this deal happens and you yeah. diagnose. I mean, but did you get it? Did you understand what had happened? So it was. It's really funny. So I, I obviously do keynote. I do keynote speaking, and and a lot of the times after I finish speaking, my, the hero is my parents, not me, which is which is absolutely right. So they didn't tell me, "Hey, you're blind. Your whole life's changing. Everything's different. Um, these are all the problems that your life's going to be." They were like, "Hey, hey well, there's a bit of a problem here with your eyes. We're just going to work it out. Don't don't stress. It's okay." So that there was never a problem. It didn't happen overnight, though, did it? Did, 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 is it a, a degenerative year. thing? One year, right? So it happened pretty quick. Um, but I was already, I was already catching a ball. I was playing footy, and then I started playing footy, and um, that all happened. And that was like, that was my pet. So the, an example of that was my parents sheltered me from all this discrimination that happens in the world. So um, the my dad was having a beer with a few mates, and they said, well, does, um, "Does Matt have any mates that want to play as under fives um, or under sixes?" And that dad said, well, Matt will play because it is, they didn't have enough players in the team. And they what, said, we're talk, oh, what, what we're talking about now? Rugby league. Rugby league. Um, and the, basically his mates that he was having a beer with said, oh, but Don, your, your son's Matt's blind. You, know, he can't play, you can't let him play. It made him out to be a bad parent because he was putting his child with a disability in harm's way in a contact sport. Whereas, I mean, the other way that you probably should look at it is, oh my God, this guy's giving his child with a disability an opportunity. But that wasn't the way the world looked at it. And they, so they, but they never, he never came up and said, hey, God, these guys don't want you to play. He came up and said, you're in, let's go. We're going to play footy. We'll work it out. And then um, worked out that me being dummy half was a great place for me to be because I'm always in the center of the play. I can pick the ball off the ground and feed the boys and, and learn to read the play. And then um, my disability ended up becoming an advantage. Um, I ended up becoming captain of the team because when the other boys are all, when the first grade's playing, all the other boys are running around wrestling and whatever. I'm sitting there with the other, or they're watching a bit, but they, they can't really work out what's going on. I'm watching with my dad and all these older pl- people that have played the game forever, talking through, like, they just did this. They moved, the defense moved up too quick. They didn't stay together, telling me about what's happening like in the game. Yeah, so I'm getting commentary of different graded games. So then I learned the game. So my my, strategy, my way to understand and read the game was way beyond my ears because of the amount of hours I had listening to that knew the game. Can you just take me through what happens? Like you're dummy half. How do you know the ball is going to be played? Well, example? I can I can see enough to see that the way the ball. So that there's there's movement. So I can see the ball. Everyone's running over that way. So they're not going over there to get an ice cream most of the time. That's the ball. That's where the ball's going. Yeah. So I follow them over that way, and then like the ball's white. The grass the, gra- the the grass is green. So you can see the difference of color. You can see the contrast. Yep. So how do you know your the bloke your who's your dummy half too? In other words, who's playing the yeah. ball? Let's see enough to see to see that. So I can see that there's been a right. tackle. There's been multiple people in an area together. Right. So there's a little blur. So I can see that. So I get in, and then I can see the ball getting passed. So I'm following just total focus on where the ball is. So I can see the ball get passed. I chase in defence. You know what I mean. I see where the ball. I just follow and follow and follow the ball. And then if the if the players step back in, um, like I'd get penalised every now and then for tackling someone that didn't have a ball. <laughs> and can you can you hear the ball? By the way, can you yeah, hear, I hear the ball hit the ground? Hundred percent. I can hear the ball leaving leaving someone's hand. I can hear it so catching someone else catching the ball. It makes a lot of sound. I can hear people. Everyone that you know. There's sound as everyone's boots are hitting the ground. So there's all this information that I'm learning to interpret um, that I'm using. And then I ended up the ball. The game got too fast for me. So the league became too fast, and I went and played rugby union because that flowed better. Um, and I ended up playing blindside breakaway, which you know has become a the play my own only good joke when I do keynote speaking. Um, but that, but in that position, I only had to be on the side of the ruck, and then deal with the the halfback and the and the and the winger or maybe an outside centre in defence. And that was just really good in defence. And I stayed out of any set plays with the ball. So um, yeah. yeah, just learn where I, where I work, where I fit into the team, and um, and then where I'm not, where like where are my strengths and where are my weaknesses. Don't don't get involved in those particular parts of the game. So what what would you say your strengths and your weaknesses are? Because I mean, I don't think that's a fair question because yeah. I, mean, I reckon you're going to be pretty honest with me. So yeah, like let's say. Let's well, I'm not definitely about- not going to be good at catching a cutout ball. I can tell you that yeah. much. <laughs> um, and and or a bomb. You know, I mean, I'm not catching as if they're definitely my so weaknesses. You didn't, play, you didn't play fullback. No. Um, so I'm always going to be a forward. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty much as tough as it gets like I don't get I don't really get hurt if I get hurt it's gonna have to be enough that my, my body doesn't function anymore for me to stop um, and you know there was in, in rugby union people would say how's this kid where does he keep coming out with the ball I, I'd feel the energy in the rock and I'd get myself in there and just the technique and my, my, my power like my strength my power like 
pounds per square inch, like the, for the size of me, the amount of power I could output, I could get a ball off pretty much anyone. So. And in terms of fitness? I'd train every day. So I knew that I was dis- I had a disability. So every morning I'd do basically before school when I was, you know, as a teenager, I'd run 15 kilometers. I'd come home and jump on my bike, ride my bike for a bit. I'd go swimming. I knew I had to be the fittest bloke on the field to be able to keep it because I was going to make mistakes because of my eyesight. And I didn't want to be, you know, a liability for the boys on the field. And it had, so my fitness and my strength had to be stronger than everyone so that I could make up for my disability. What about your strength of character? I mean, how does that work? Uh, you know, I guess, did you get that from your parents? I mean, how do you build up in that environment, like your, your, your mental strength? Well, I, so the, and I've worked this out now, you know, looking back at it, I didn't know why at the time, but I was trying to prove to the world I didn't have a disability. Because at school, I was, you know, I was bullied. People would throw comments out, make different voices so they didn't know who was saying it. They'd stand just out of nah, reach and say, how many, how many fingers am I holding up? And Nah. Oh, mate, it was horrendous. So at school, I've got this, I'm treated like this kid that's a pariah. But then on the footy field, I'm one of the best kids on the field. So I get, you know, I'm included and I'm one of the boys. So that sport was always the thing for me where I felt included. And there was never, there was never, oh, you're a disabled kid, you don't miss the tackle. If I missed the tackle, the boys were into me. Like, why'd you miss that tackle? You know, it wasn't, you know, maybe I didn't see the pass, but that's no, that's not an excuse because you're letting the team down. So I felt like I was included in part as part of the team. So that, was my drive is just to prove to the world I didn't have a disability. And that, that went through for me until I was probably 20 years old. We hear a lot about dis- disability these days. So yeah. We never used to hear much about it no, no. Know, in previously. My observation yeah. is that a lot of people talk about Black Lives Matter or Black Lives yeah. are not black. They're white. And it's sort of like uh, white privileged people sort of, sort of um, I don't know, it feels like making going to the confession and uh, uh, and trying to make up for all the – Shit that the the broader society does, yeah, and, it, and to some extent, I feel as a little bit the same when it comes to disability. A lot of people are sort of apologists, whereas the people who are disabled or black people, they don't they're not looking for apologists. They're they're not feeling they're not looking for sympathy. They just want you to treat them like everybody else. My the thing that I see, like I obviously have a disability myself. I work a lot in this space. Fifty percent of my role now is in the in the diversity and disability space. Um, and I'm on a few different disability boards as well. So it's very, I'm very prominent in this field. Um, the, a lot of the issues that I see come from fear. People want to help, but they're scared of helping and they're making, of making a mistake, saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. And I think that's, putting, that's really setting us back at the moment. I think if people have an intent, if the intent is there to help um, and you, you're having a crack, people don't care if you make a mistake. Um, and I think that's that's one thing. And then the other thing is this whole disability, ab- all abilities thing. And everyone's got their own take on it. But I think it's a big mistake because it's you've got a disability. It's, a dis- it's something that's not functioning the same as everybody else in your body. So it's a disability. Just because you have a disability doesn't mean you can't go and do everything else that everyone else can do. But you do it, you're just having to uh, adapt and do things differently because you have a disability. So that was a big thing for me that would changed my whole life is when I – Went from being, I'm not disabled, I can prove to you all I'm not disabled, to going, you know what, I'm fucking disabled and I've got this dis- I've got this thing in me that doesn't work. I'm going to tell you all that it doesn't work. Can you help me out a bit? And I might make my life a bit, make it easier for me, it'll make it easier for you because we're all walking on edge around the fact that I can't see and it changed my whole life. So now I'm like, that's what I lead with. And in business, right, we all we all want to differentiate. We all want to go, okay, look, as you know, trying to sell a television or a car, they're all the same, but you want to differentiate some way. But then as people, we all go in and on it with our CV and go, oh, I do this, this, and this, and this, but I'm going to hide my differentiation behind me because in, in case they think I'm different. I, I lead and I teach my people, lead with your, dis- with your differentiation. I have a disability. That's the top of my resume. I've got a disability, but despite my disability, I've done all these other things, and that's built me resilience, and it makes shows that I'm a problem solver because I can use you know other ways of resolving things because I've got this disability. Therefore, how do you feel about people, you know, presenting themselves as apologists all the time? Because you know what I mean. I mean, I guess it's, it's I mean, putting yeah. everything backwards. It's, yeah, because it's not about that. As you said, it's about just creating opportunity. It just it's just creating an equal playing field for everyone, whether that's you have. Different coloured skin, or if you have a disability, or if you got different language, it's just everyone should be treated the same way and given the same opportunities. Unfortunately, with the disability piece, there's a lot of challenges around um, just accessibility. Like I can't, couldn't read a. I was, you know, running huge accounts you know, as, a, as, a, as a sales director, and I had a back in the like 
2010s, all my colleagues had Blackberries and they had email and calendars, everything on their phone. I've got a I've got a Nokia because I can't see the the BlackBerry. I've got a Nokia with and I'd have to like feel the five. There's a little dot on the five, so I'd have yep. about six people's numbers I'd memorize, so I could ring them. I'd have to memorize all my meetings for the day. That my turn by turn location, I'd use the Sun to navigate because I know the Sun's going to be in the north in the middle of the day, so then I know which way I'm going north, south, east, west to, to get to my meetings. And then I get to the meeting and they are oh, sorry, so that was cancelled two hours ago. But my my colleagues had the uh, cancellation on their BlackBerry. So in 2009, I think it was, Apple brought out the um, 3GS phone and it had voiceover on it. So from one day, one day I had nothing on my phone. I couldn't even use it. The next day I've got turn-by-turn navigation, uh, email, calendar. I can read websites better than I could ever read any, anything before I'm on a device that's this big. I couldn't even do that on a big computer. So the, all this accessibility stuff that's happening is helping and, and you know ramps for ramps for people in wheelchairs. You build the ramp for the person in a wheelchair, but it also helps the old guy that's got a bad knee, and it helps you know the very pregnant lady to get into that building. So, as you develop all these this accessibility stuff, it's not just helping the people that have this user need in dis, in disability space. It's helping everybody. And did you have to go and learn to read Braille? No, mate, I didn't because I wanted to prove to the world I didn't have a disability. I, I refused to learn, to learn Braille. So how did you learn at school? I example? listened. You listened. Yeah, ask questions. Yeah, so obviously you had to be accommodated to some extent. I mean, I guess the teacher was probably aware of it, but you went, you just went to a, the school. Where, where'd you grow up? Which area? Uh, Narrabeen. Narrabeen. So you yeah. went to a Narrabeen High, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no point writing it down, but does no. what helps What helps your memory? Well, I, writing helps my memory. If I write it, I'm more likely to remember it. Yep. Uh, I'd put things into like the patterns, the same as the finding the bathroom in Italy. I f- sort of, I put things into pattern so if it's a scientific if i'm doing science and i'm learning about a formula or something i just find a way to associate that word with something else in my in my brain and just say it, you know say it a few times and then i'll come back and do it and then i or i'll also go back at the end of a and it's like note taking but i'm doing it mentally um i was that kid in the class and the anyone that now that's here in this that went to school with me probably knows i was annoying as far as asking that many questions but when i was asking the questions that was me reiterating the points, and that was the way I took notes, is by verbalizing stuff and and making sure that it was accurate. The other part was I couldn't go home and do um, read my notes or do homework really. Like my mum would help me as much as she could, and she'd read stuff to me, and I'd tell her. But I, re- I you know, I couldn't really do homework, so I had to learn everything in class and take and, and and focus on that. And but but that that whole lot, you know, by choosing to do that and not learn braille, what that did was it gave me, a, you know, my whole tertiary education, my whole schooling from kindergarten through to university was all, it was basically a sales and, 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 and leadership training because I'm listening the whole time, focused on what I'm doing, 100% focused, listening, learning, being able to ask really concise questions um, and get the information I needed to move on. So it, it's a different way of doing things, but it's it set me up for the for the person I am in business now. But that's mad, like, because uh, your memory from what you hear hmm. and or what you ask mm-hmm. Would you verbalize? Hmm. What be, I experience must be fucking incredible. Like, uh, I mean, like some people can tell me the same thing ten times over, and yeah. because I'm not actually focusing on it, yeah, um, I probably don't retain it. Yeah, I mean, do, are you getting to as we get older, though. Yeah. I mean, I know this to be a fact. Yeah, as we get older, we get less room. Yes, and we tend to um, just concentrate on what's important. Yeah, are you starting to experience that a little bit now? Definitely, and I think as well because of the amount of hats I wear these days as an athlete, as a businessman, and I'm on, on a couple of different boards, and I've got multiple things going on um there's definitely not as much capacity to get into the details but i think as well it's giving me like the roles that i'm in now in those positions it's very much the high level get into the detail when i need to but the most of the time just understanding the high level what's going on and getting and helping my team own the detail so um at the moment i'm okay but i can definitely foresee in the next 10 20 years that there's going to be some capacity issues and i'm hoping that the technology will evolve to help me bridge that gap don't fucking worry mate like once you said <laughs> everyone says it's selective memory it's not fucking bullshit yeah i've got so much stuff i've i've had to sort of try and retain over the period my yeah. brain's just gone i'm tapping out i'm saying yeah. like, fuck, i don't want any more information you know and, and i'm i think what's happening is i'm actually dropping shit out so they can fit something else in that might be more important. And, and my old man, I was talking to my dad's 90, and, I was, and he was telling me that, he said, you wait to get to 90. He said, like, it gets worse. He said, I started, that, that said it uh, only the week, and he said, I started thinking to myself, as my dad speaking, that um, 
I was getting Alzheimer's or something like that. He said, because I was forgetting stuff. He said, but I also realized that I'm in new shit's coming in every day. He said, I just don't have any room for any more information. Yeah. He said, I just remember now the important stuff. And I'm, and what's, you know, I, we don't learn just from what we hear or what we ask. We learn from what we see as well. And uh, I can only imagine it would, I would be dead set exhausted at the end of the day if I was doing what you do. 100%. So not, not many people pick up on that, but I am. I'm always tired, um, especially when I'm traveling, I'm getting through airports, doing all that stuff. Um, it's yeah, it's exhausting because um, I'm every footstep, every time I put, every single time I put 100%. my foot down, I'm having to feel the ground to see if I'm going to stub my toe or smash my shin into something, or slip over, or run into a child or an old lady, or you know hurt someone else. Which is I'd rather, much rather hurt myself than hurt someone else. So it's um, and then I'm trying to be on, on a call and um, it's yeah, it's, it's it's exhausting, but it is what it is. Do, do you don't have a, a cane or anything along those? I lines? do have a cane. You do have a cane. Yeah, but I used a cane. Um, I went to the Paralympics in Rio, and and what what were you competing in? Cycling. Yep, and um, so it's the Olympics is you know I think people always say there's all the different body shapes. So you go to the Olympics, you can see you can visually visually see someone that walks into the food hall and go that's a that's a basketball player, that's a volleyball player, that's a that's a rower, that's a cyclist. You know what I mean? Um, you go to the Paralympics and there's all there's that plus so you've got all the different body shapes because of the sport they've trained for plus all the disabilities and amputations and wheelchairs and everything else so there's just it's crazy so we were coming out of the food uh, food hall and the Israeli um, wheelchair rugby team were coming flying down the ramp into the um, into the food hall so one of the, our physios was there saw me that I wasn't moving so they're just like we're coming down if you don't get out of the way they're just going to snap your ankle they've got roll bars in the front of their their wheelchairs bumper bars bumper bars I'm just going to straight straight through so one of the guys pulled me out of the way anyway the reason I tell that story so my physio said you're where you're using your cane for the rest of the time you're here because we can't have you get injured because people don't can't see that you're so they can they can stop and not take you out hopefully yeah. because they can see that you're blind yeah yeah so I was wearing using it for other people rather than for me so I used that for two weeks solid and by the after when I took when I put it down after those two weeks and went to walk around the Olympic Village, I was so lost. I couldn't. I'd lost all my proprioception skills. My echolocation. I use echolocation, which is like bats. They can hear the noise bouncing off objects. So I couldn't. I was just. I was almost scared to walk around because I'd lost all my skills after two weeks. So I use my cane sparingly when I need it for different areas and for showing other people. Like when I travel internationally, if I'm traveling by myself internationally, I use a cane so that people can see I'm blind. It's more a sign. Help, they'll help me out. Yeah, it's yeah. more of a sign. But as I use it, it's like a comfort blanket. It's what you said about I'm exhausted. I'm not exhausted because I'm using my cane and I can just. It's so relaxing. It's like your comfy blanket, comfy pillow at night. I'm just yeah, like yeah. cool. I'm cool. I can just walk around. I know I'm not going to run into somebody. Hopefully, and someone's be, not going to run into you. Oh mate, you'd be surprised. Serious? Oh, all the time. You said um, uh, you use sound like bats do. Hmm. What does that mean? No, no, no. So it was just it was one one of these things as well. I didn't know about it. You can actually try. It's called echolocation. So you're using the sound that's bouncing off objects to capture information. So as I walk down a hallway, um, I can strike my heels and it taps and it sends a, a sound out. And then I can hear where the walls are and I can hear if there's a soft object because if you're standing there, the noise isn't bouncing back at me. Off, so it's, so there's hard objects, soft objects. So I can sort of get a map of what's around me by hearing by using sound. I'm only able to articulate that because of these types of conversations because I just did it. You know, when people say, how do you walk? How do you explain to someone how you walk? Totally. It's like you. So, I, like, how do you how do you get around? I don't know. I just get around. So, um, but it's yeah, it's called echolocation. And there's guys now in the states that can train people. So, if you're blind and you want to learn this skill, there's guys now that have worked out how to train it. Um, but I just it just was just something that I picked up riding skateboards, riding around the street with my mates. I just got better and better and better. And my body just obviously evolved because it needed that skill and it just built it. It's funny because it's only a couple of days, a couple of nights ago, I was watching something on BBC on the TV, and um, they had this woman. Um, who's blind, mm. and she was in, on a safari, her first safari, mm -hmm. and uh, and she was talking to the guide, and she was saying how important it was to her to go on a safari. In it was in Africa, mm. um, how she could hear the sounds, the richness of the sounds, and the smells, and but probably more around the sounds. Yeah, and she could sort of pretty much. Um, imagine, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. is probably the best word to use, mm -hmm. what was around her mm -hmm. as a safari. Mm -hmm. And I, I, 
I thought about that, and now now here's someone like you telling me exactly that's what happens. Mm -hmm. You can draw, a, you can write your own story, nearly mm -hmm. about what's what that sounds like. Mm -hmm. You know, like you you might be able to tell the sound of a rhinoceros if that's what's going around the place. Yeah, and uh, and you're building maps maps in your in your brain. Yeah, uh, and the brain's a fucking incredible thing. Like, it's, yeah. I mean, you must become very appreciative of how good the brain is. Oh yeah, but but I use different like I when people say to me oh they can see like yesterday my wife was saying get the sun cream or something or get the one that was the kids hat or something in the house and she's our pool's out the way out the back of our house she's seeing from inside the pool area to under my hand I can't see under my hand she's like just to your right so she's seeing something from forty meters away in through glass from out in our you know and I'm like how how do you do that so I'm amazed at what you guys do with your senses whereas I just use, I just use them differently. So I, I'm looking at you, and you're talking about um, being able to hear really well, and I started looking at your ears, and I thought, hang on, are his ears a little bit more turned towards me than normal? Like, a, 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 and I, I think and I, I shoved my head in a few too many scrums, mate. Well, no, yeah. that could be it. It could look like you could have been wrestling with Alex Volkanovsky or something like that. But, <laughs> but, I, but I'm just I'm wondering to think, he's got those super fucking human ears because uh, they look like, I'm not joking, Yeah, they look like they're, watching me yeah, yeah, yeah your ears look like they're fucking watching me <laughs> i know it sounds yeah. i know i'm not trying to be a smart ass yeah, yeah, yeah. i really believe that yeah, yeah. well that's that's watch with I'm, ears yeah but my, my nose is actually what i get most wait i get the most sensitive information out of so really? you're saying yeah so you're saying about the safari so if i go into a food court food court yeah i can find the food i want no by the by the smell and then i use the sound so you can hear different sounds so like a, a, an asian place will be sounds of the walk out yeah, the yeah. back yep and then so there's different sound there's information i can use i can find a chemist with my nose i can find a, um, a news agent you know they all smell differently so i just walk around i can walk around a shopping center and find whatever i want using my sound using smell everybody has become a, uh, has become really tuned and it, it has become a big deal about um mindfulness yes and you know, one of the things i say to us all in the morning you just don't throw your coffee down your gob, um, smell it, taste it, yeah. and, and just be mindful of the moment. Yeah. It would appear to me that you're constantly mindful. Mate, I drink my coffee quicker than anyone in the world. But, you, but you're constantly mindful. Because, <laughs> like, you know, like I wouldn't be aware of the smell of something. Yeah, yeah no. I'm, I'm very mindful. And, like, as, and especially in the sports that I've played, I've become – That's I think that's what was one of the things why, I, why I've been so successful is that I'm very – I've become very good at just being very focused on what I'm doing right now. And my team would say that. They know that – um, despite whatever I've got going, all those hats that I mentioned, when I'm with them, I'm with them 100%. So whatever I do, I'm doing it 100%. I'm completely mindful in that moment of what I'm doing. Um, and that's like the big wave surfing I do now. Like it's people can't work out how it's physically possible, but I'm so present in what's happening in my body and everything else. I just, every, everything else disappears and I'm just doing that one thing. And my, through the thousands of hours of training I've done, my body just knows what to do. I want to talk about that because, I mean, I was I was a surfer until I was 20. I stopped, I stopped surfing for, for a whole lot of reasons. Yeah. But one, a big wave surfer, I don't know if many people understand, like that is the most fucking scary thing in the world. Do you, do you get taken out on a ski? Yeah, yeah, like you, be, I used to surf Nazare last year. Yeah, so you get you got can't paddle, can't, yeah. fifty foot waves. You can't paddle into no, those waves. So you get, yeah. yeah, okay. So yeah. like, that's a big deal. Yeah. Um. Do you, how do you know the difference between a left hand and a right hand? I mean, what's the deal? How do you work that out? Uh. Well, we we make it just with big for for like for Nazare, for example, where we decide we we're only going to go right on this day. So if we're going to change and go left, they'll tell me. They'll call out that you know. But most of the time, if it's big waves, because there's so much going on, we'll just go one direction. So that take, that takes out of the equation. In the surf, when I'm competing, so I, I compete, um, the guys that spot for me, they call a spotter, they'll go, Maddie, I think there's a right coming. And then they'll talk me, say, paddle, paddle north, south to get me in the right position and I'm into the wave. And then they might say, like, you know, sometimes a wave's coming and then it just last minute it hits the bank differently and it changes and bec becomes a left. So they'll just go left, left, and they'll, they'll send me left. So, so you have a spotter. Have a spotter in the water, yeah. But then big wave surfing, we've got a... We used an orientation. So the, for anyone, Nazare is the, the spot in Portugal with the big lighthouse for anyone, you know. The, yep. I think anyone that's even a not a surfer knows what that is. And it's the biggest waves in the world there. So we, we surfed there and it's it's caught, like someone died six weeks after I was there. It's, it's a serious place. Um, we used the, we, I'd use like saying yes, yes, yes. So if we say go, 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 what does that sound like? Go, go, go. Yeah. Well, not what it sounds like. No, no, no. So it does, yeah. Yeah. So you don't want to be you don't want to be about to take jump down the ledge of a fifty foot wave and someone's going, you know, go go go, and you don't know if it's yes 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 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so, totally, yeah. so we just say yes yes. Everything's yes and no. But then at that point we're like, well, could like there's jet skis going around. There's so much noise and whatever. So we've got an orientation whistle, and 
basically they don't blow the whistle until they're 100% sure it's the right way. And then as soon as they blow the whistle, I've got to have 100% trust in the boys that they're, you know, when you pull up to the headland there, you look at the headland, you, most people go, there's no fucking way I'm going in the wall. That's, that's, a, that's a wall zone. I'm not going out there. It's not, not, that's not, there's nothing part of me that wants to do that. Or I think I can do it. And then you get to the water and you go, actually, not, not today. It's too big for me. I can't do any of that. So the boys have already made the decision that we're going out, that I'm capable of it. So the, and then they send me on the wave. So they blow the whistle. I've got to have 100% trust that they're sending me on a good wave. I pull the rope and just drop down the face of the wave. And it's all trust. So and then I'm going, and that's the I love. I've always loved contact sport, team sports. So like, it's that's once again it's that inclusion. Like I'm being included with the best big wave surfers in the world taking me out surfing. And then I go down the wave, and then they worked out that I wasn't turning early enough because you're going, you know, sixty plus kilometers an hour on waves that big. I wasn't feeling the bottom of the wave enough, and I was turning too late. So then they blew the, the, the Lucas Chumbo was my spotter over there, and Dylan Longbottom. And they basically ride the edge of the wave. So as I'm going on, they can see they're riding on the jet ski. They can see me down the face, down the corner of the wave. And then as I'm getting to the bottom, they blow the whistle again, and I turn. The bottom man turned at the bottom. So yep. like at the right time. At though. the right time. So you're not obviously right at the bottom, but they know when I need to play the whistle. And then I react straight away. I'm not. There's no delay. Like I think you know, as soon as I hear the whistle, I turn. And then I start my bottom turn. It's like a long, drawn out bottom turn on what the waves over there. And then and then the third. Then they blow the whistle a third time for me to kick out. So this is a really team effort, though. 100%. Fully team effort. 100%. Uh, but it, it is for everyone over there, but my team just has to operate differently. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah totally. Yeah. Have you experienced any really shitty wipeouts? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my, the biggest wave. That which, would be scary. It was, but mate, for I trained. For me, I'm talking about. Yeah, but yeah, and it's all, it's, all, it's all relative and it's all capacity. You know, you build capacity in these different areas. So I went there knowing that I'd not, you can't overtrain for a place like that, but I was, I trained really hard. So what does that include? A lot of breath training. So I'd done the surfing. I, surfing's not a big part of the training because I can surf. I've been surfing. I'm a professional surfer, four-time world champion. The surfing will happen. It's the what happens when the surfing doesn't happen. Yeah. That's what you need to train for. So if you fall off your board over there, that's when things go really, really bad and you need to be able to calm. Till. So it was um, breath, a lot of breath training, a lot of carbon, carbon dioxide mean? tolerance. So swimming under the, under the water, doing laying in my, laying, doing passive breath holds in my bed at night. Um, walking, doing lots of walking. Uh, underwater? No, no, just just in my street. So just from oh, my really? house. Yep. So I was doing a minute and a minute and 20 second breath hold. So I just walk actively. So it's, stimu it's simulating um, increasing carbon dioxide like you would be if you're holding onto the rope. But then, and then I reduce my, uh, so you, you might get up and hold one, do one breath and it's another breath that's going to hit, wave's going to hit you. So I would do a minute 20 walk and then do the first, my, my first recovery was a, a minute and a half. And then I'd come down a minute 15, a minute 45, 30, and the last one's 15 seconds. So you've already built up massive amounts of carbon dioxide in your blood. So by the time you do that last effort, it's it's real. Like there's these physiological things that happen in your body you don't even know about. But as you start getting to that point in your your your, um, your gallbladder releases blood because it's basically saying you're running out of oxygen, and so it pushes blood into your system, and you do a little wee in your pants. So you, it's all these little weird things that happen yeah. in your body, but you're just learning. So you're simulating what's going to happen under those big waves. So you've done all, most of it, apart from the actual beating. So your body's experienced it. Um, and then, yeah, just long breath holds. So I, I could hold my breath for um, six minutes just before I went, like a single breath for six minutes underwater. Okay, let's just, yeah. you train like that. And yeah. then, you just tell me, yeah. what was the, the sense you got, though, yeah. the very first time you had got tested? A big a big wave? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm chill. Like I just lay underwater and I'll keep my arms, I pull my arms in so I don't dislocate my shoulder, and I don't I keep my abs locked in so I don't break my back, and that's it. And then I just it, I've I've never panicked underwater. I yeah, just, I was going to talk to you yeah. about the panic bit. No, and, and the main that, that's when you die, right? You panic, you die. That's they're 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 linear. Um, so it's you just stay. I I love it. Like I love. I think if you're going out in waves like that, you have to want it. Um, but I, yeah, I love it and. Yeah, the boys freaked out massively, um, and we, we documented this part of the film, but you'll see it in the movie. But they were all losing their minds, and that they, and then what the last wave, the biggest wave I got over there, which we're putting in for Guinness World Records at the moment. How big was it? Uh, it was about fifty-five feet. What the fuck? Um, and it, it got me, so I got done at the end of that wave. And look, I was like, came, I watched in, and they couldn't get to me. So they said, whatever happens, we're going to get to you. They couldn't, they couldn't get to me. And the second wave hit me. And it just drove me back that hard. So the waves are traveling at you know fifty k's an hour or something. It hit me. I'm sitting in the water stationary, and then it hit me and just drove me like fifty k, like the acceleration. And then it's just dragging me and bouncing me through the water. 
Um, and th so there was four cameras. So we're filming a movie, right? There's four cameras on land. There's two cameras on jet skis in the water. I've got three safety skis and I've got two drones above me. No one could find me. Oh, my God. And I'm, I'm in a bright orange wetsuit. That's how far I got dragged underwater. But I came up. I was sweet. It was, you know, it was a bit of, it was, got, I got belted, but it was, I was like, I was having, having the time of my life. And then I was like, one more to Lucas. And he was like pulling the tower up and like, no, we're done. No, because he's done. <laughs> he, he was done. They were done. They said, like, fuck this. We don't want any more of the stress. Yeah. So can, talk, talk, can you just talk me about the movie? Like, yeah. uh, what, 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 what's the movie about? Is it a doco or what is it's it? It's a doco. It's about my life. So it's, it's, it's basically a 90 minute doco. It's, uh, it's called The Blind Sea, S E A. Um, it's a bit of a play on words, um, but it's basically the first 45 minutes is about my backstory of growing up with a disability, um, interviewing my friends and family and, you know, what, what, what who's met forms them. Um, and the last 45 minutes is literally 10 days in Nazareth of how we prepped for it, how we did it, and um, and then the footage of the of the waves. Even somebody like a, a person who's not blind yeah. would shit themselves Going for surf there. Oh yeah, most people, most mean, professional surfers wouldn't want to have any. Part they're of it. professional surfers, and they're people who've surfed all their whole life. Yeah, yeah. Who actually know how to surf. People that get paid to the prof actual professional surfers get paid to surf. Wouldn't, probably wouldn't want to have any part so, of it. So, yeah. do you, are you like a? I mean, do you, would you see yourself as a like a natural adventurer? Is that yes. Your, irrespective of, of the fact that you're blind, I mean, irrespective 100%. of that. Well, my, I don't know. Maybe my blindness made me that adventurer oh, because so? maybe because well, it made me do things different. Like I've always had to be different to everyone else, and it just made me be comfortable being different and doing my and, and forging my own path. Yeah, but like taking risks. Yeah, I think I would have been a risk taker. Well, yeah, was your old man like that, or your mum like this? Is that a family thing? No, nah, dad's really conservative. Mum's out there. She's quite. She's a. Um, I'd say. Um, like a conservative hippie, like she, you know, she's she's out there. She's into all sort of uh, d different uh, different things. But um, no, I I don't know. I don't know. I'm just it's just me. Yeah, was, it's, it's like more of a social formation. Like uh, growing up, you became that person. Yeah, like I grew up in like in Narrabeen. Damien Hardner was in was in my street. He was a world champion surfer. I had I caught the bus to school with. with um, Nathan Hedge and the, all these pro surfers and everyone was, you know, they're all surfers and I wanted to be a pro surfer too and I thought that was never a possibility for me, having a disability. And then, you know, they got to go and compete and I, I would never compete. Um, and they always used to say to me in the water, and I could just actually say this for the first time properly on this podcast, um, they'd say, imagine if they'd let you blind fuckers compete against each other. They said that? Yeah, all my mates. Imagine that you'd beat everyone. And I'd, and I'd be like, no, nah, they're never going to, it's too dangerous. Imagine that, we'll run each, we'll kill each other. It's never going to happen. And then before I was on, when I was training, I was in Italy training for the um, base camp for, for Rio Paralympics. And my mate texts me and he's like, you wouldn't fuck, you wouldn't believe it. They're going to let you blind fuckers compete against each other with a press release that they were going to do the first world championships for para surfing. Um, so that was my upbringing. You know, that was, I was just in there with the boys, but I couldn't really compete with them. Um, and then, you know, at the age of, you know, in my thirties, when I just retired from cycling, became a pro surfer and now. Yeah, uh, this year I actually won the the heavy water award for surfing Australia, which was an able bodied award. So I was the first para surfer to win a, a, a like a prestigious able bodied award in like in heavy in big wave surfing. How old are you now? I'm forty five. Forty five. Forty five yeah. years of age. Yeah. Married. Married. Three kids. Three and everyone's like no one's. It's not a genetic thing that they. No, they they say it could go through my my daughter might have um they might my daughters might have boys that might have it. Yeah, so it's like, like a might skip a generation. Yeah, yeah, yep. Okay, but so, but the the kids are good. Kids uh, are good. No dramas. Oh yeah. mate, it's, it's, every day is a, a challenge. But no, no, yeah, well, no, because no. the kids. But yeah, that's normal. <laughs> that's normal. No visual, no visual issues. They're all they're all great, healthy, very very active. There and they're crazy athletes as well. Most of my son. Is my oldest son's played rep footy already, and he's anything he touches, he's pretty good at. How old is he? He's nine. So, like, you go along to his match. Yeah. Can you get a sense of what's going on? Well, I coached his team last year. So wow. His league team. We I coached the team for the year, and well, I coached them for three seasons. Um, and last year they were undefeated. And I think once again, it's just the way I approach things. Is I, I because as a, you know, a lot of coaches go, you got to do this, you got to do this, boys, you got to do this. And I I taught them because you're on the field, obviously, with them until they're under, under sevens or under eights. While I was in the field with them, I got them to run the field because they know I can't see. But I, and they also I gave, gave them this sense of ownership that you know they could get they could get away with stuff if they wanted to because I can't see. 
but is that really the right thing to do? And you know, and they'd come down on pretty hard, and they'd all come down on their other on the rest of them if they were trying to get over me because of my blindness. And I think um, through them having to own the and manage the field themselves, they they obviously set their own little leadership up, structure up, and they 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 manage each other as a team. So you hear them now on the field talking to each other, um, in you know under tens as a team, the way they structure and, and own a, a, a field, they they just dominate because of the because of you know I suppose the tools that I've given them. But there, there's some good little athletes in there as well, obviously. But yeah, they they, they do really well. So like at half time, let's say they're, they're yeah. run behind, they're yeah. ten points behind or whatever. Yeah. See, they're under ten. So yeah. they, they, you get off and say, okay, boys, what what's going on out there? So I've got a coach. I've got a coach that sits with me. So my assistant coach, he tells me what's going on. So I'm listening. He's I'm going, who's doing this? Who's missed that tackle? Why'd they score that try? So he's giving me all that verbal feedback. Yep. And it's obviously his interpretation of it too, right? So he Clearly. might, you know, so there's got to take that into consideration. Um. And then I, but then I so get that map in my head. Where are we going wrong? How do we, where do we need to up, increase? But it's not about beating them up. For me, like even if I'm working with top, you know, athletes in the NRL, wherever it is, you know the process. You've done it. You do your training every week. Forget about all the whatever the rubbish. If bad stuffs happen, that's fine. Go back to basics. It's simple footy. You know, you know what to do. Go back to that, and you win. As long as you've got your discipline right and you've got your structure right. That's where that's where that's and then and then once you've got the foundation and you're feeling like you're doing well, start taking some more risks, throw the ball around, move it around, and it's just the same all the time. Whether they're winning or losing, it's always just get it back to basic, simple football. Don't make errors. If you and if you're feeling like you're confident and, you've, and you're not making the errors, throw the ball around and and take some more risks. So it's, it's sort of like you give them the map. Yeah, correct. The, the, the map that you've got in your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You give them the map. Correct. And and it's funny you should say that because you know I remember that uh, once Gus Philgill told me that one of the ways that State of Origins one, him being the most successful New South Wales coach ever, yeah, um, is by telling every player what their job is, yeah, and just just go out and stick to your fucking job, yeah, and just do your job, hundred percent, and and stay in one formation, yep. up back up. If you're defending, up back up back, and if you're attacking, this is what this is, these are the plays, yeah, you know, three three at the guts and yep. you know three at the back, whatever the case may be, fifth, yep. fifth tackle uh, kick, yep. and it's it's I think life is like that. It is our whole life is like that. Yeah, it's just about just doing. You're just running a map and doing yeah. your thing, and often we get a little bit panicky yeah. about um, <laughs> you know, like when we f- we feel like a little, we panic when we feel like we've lost control. Yeah, and I can imagine when you're in the big surf, you know, yeah. you're there at the there at um, surfing in, the, in that for for your movie yeah. or for your uh, doco. Yeah, and I immediately thought to myself, I would be panicking yeah. because I know I just analyze it then my own yeah. mind. It's because I feel like I lost control. Yeah, yeah. And that happens in business too. Yeah, yeah. You fucking feel like you lose control, yeah. you panic, yeah. and your life becomes shitty. Yeah. And it, but it's you. It's nothing wrong. Correct. And I've got to be like you. I've got to trust in my training. I've got to. We're all got to be. We've got to trust in what we know, what yeah. we've experienced. Yeah. And maybe we're not. We might not go as far as you do. Sort of say you're actually enjoying it coming yeah. out the other end. Yeah. You know, but. That, that's a really big lesson for everybody. Do you actually talk about that in keynotes and stuff like that? I do, yeah. So, you know, for me now, people go, how do you do manage the stress in a heat? Like you could be – now I compete in surfing and they're normally 20 or 40-minute heats and you could be down with, you know, it's 15 minutes gone. But it's go back to basics. And I, um, I'm i never going to be as stressed as I was as a cyclist. So, you you're, you know, you're, you've made it through your whole career. You've won World Cups. You've won World Titles. You get to the – you know, whatever you're at. You're at World Championships. There's a stadium full of people. They're all screaming. You've got to do four kilometers. My event was four kilometers, the the one that I was the best at. So um, you've got to keep your heart rate down because if you let your heart rate elevate while all these people are screaming and you're panicking about, I want to get this right. You know, I've done all my family, sacrificed all this time. I've been away training. I've been away traveling. Um, my work colleagues are, are, are at the moment, you know, you start thinking about all this stuff in your head about all the bad, all the other, all the noise, your heart rate starts creeping up. If your heart rate keeps up before you even come out of the start gate, you're done. Yeah. So you've got to keep your heart rate down. Then the, then the clock starts going. So you're locked into the gate. You're in your pet. You're locked into your pedals. You, your bike's locked into the gate. The clock starts, goes beep at 20 seconds. That's another thing where your heart rate just goes bang, nervous, <gasps> nervous, nervous, nervous. Like adrenaline. Running, yeah, adrenaline. No, stay calm. Then the, beat, then the clock goes again at 10 seconds, beep, and then another one. Stay calm. It's all good. Go back to you. Go back to what you're doing. And then it goes beep, and then it goes for the last five seconds, it'll do the beep. So five, beep, 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 and you come out. If you get your timing wrong when you come out of that gate, so if you're leant forwards before the gate releases you, you've washed all your momentum off and you're done. 
So you've just done all that. You've wasted all that time that, that you talked about your family, all the sacrifices, your sponsors spent all this money, all this stuff, right? It's all done. It's game over. You've got to come out of that. You've got to come out of the gate with split second timing, so that as you you push back on the second last beep, and then as the last beep releases the gate, you come forward and throw the bike out of the gate. And then you've got to keep your heart rate down while you're doing another four kilometers. You know, you do, we were doing sixty, averaging sixty k's an hour plus for four k's. Um, How do you keep your heart rate down? Is it breathing? Staying calm, breathing. Mentally, it's more mental than breathing. The breathing helps you with the mental part of it, but it's the mental, it's the mental anxiety that will increase your heart rate and the panic. So I and I used to, I know, um, before I found sport and you know probably found my, my wife's what gave me my consistency and my and my real grounding for me to be able to just go out and focus and do do healthy things rather than unhealthy things. But before that, I and I because of the discrimination in school and then and then the sport, I found partying and fighting and. Um, when I'd get in an altercation with someone in a pub or whatever, I just I just remember everything just going so clear and calm and it just slowed right down, and the focus to to the point where like I, I can't see, but I know if your hand, as soon as a hand hits me or gets near me, as soon as I can get that hand, I can just start moving body parts around, and it's all until it, and then until it's all over, then it's calm again. And I've just always had that in my mind. So that's really extreme example of it. But surfing's the same. Like when it's all on, it's on, it's on, and I'm focused and I'm focused and I'm focused. And then when it's over, I can just chill. But while I'm in there, my brain just seems to sl- – everything slows down and I can't – but, but I notice that when I go into a boardroom example, you know, going for a big pitch, you start getting nervous before you go in. But then – and for me, that's harder than the phys- the sporting stuff because – it's you're trying to also have a chat with someone else and you can't just be focused as an athlete you can just be completely you can always be rude to people because you're just like no I'm doing something right now you need to go away as an as a business person you can't do that so I've learnt the skills of just going go back to basics you've done the work you're an expert in this field the people you've got with you are the best people around you everything's done right just chill it's the work all the work's done now all you've got to do is go into the room and 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 deliver and just execute and that's the that's the easiest part so like as a as an Olympic, as a really good business person or as an Olympic athlete, when you get to the start gate, which is walking in the room or if it's whatever it is, if you're the winner, you've already done all the work. All you're doing in that last four minutes of effort is just, it's just a victory lap as long as you stay calm. Yeah, and, and I guess that's quite a good thing to deliver to audiences, um, your experience as an athlete, but as a blind athlete, but as an yeah. athlete as well, yeah. about how they approach their business, their business endeavours because like every – other day, there's a challenge Correct. in business. Yeah. And uh, it's about doing the work. It's about backing yourself. It doesn't always mean you're going to, you're not going to ride every wave. Sometimes you're going to get, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to bail out. 100%. You might, and you're going to get dragged along and don't worry about getting dragged along. Just, that's what you're doing. You're doing that. You're going to get dragged along and you're going to pop your head up at some stage. You're going to be able to start breathing again properly. Yeah. And you might get back on the board. You might take a break. You might get back on the board, paddle back out. Listen to your team. Teamwork's a really important thing, a great thing that you could sort of talk to us all about. Yeah. Teamwork's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, you must be like nearly an expert on teamwork. I'd say that's my biggest strength. I know how to build a team. Yeah. So in my cycling, I built a team. I got the best coaches. I ended up de- developing um, the first car- carbon tandem bikes that were ever used in international races. So I did that with three different companies. But they were they were my part of my, I, I they were part of my team. They were part of my extended team. They came in. I worked with Garmin on pedals and worked with all these different people. And I, that's what I've become really good at is building a team, staying high level, but knowing that everyone owns their piece. And then if something's starting to break, I, that's where I put my energy and kept, let the other pieces bubble away, and then put my energy into the pieces that might be a bit you know getting a little bit off track. Um, but the team is so important to me. And as a blind person, you know, I need. I need to trust that. But that was one thing that I learned, you know, probably in the last five years was because I'm very much about, well, if someone else isn't going to, if it's not getting done right, I'll just do it because I know I'm going to do it right. Whereas I was burning myself out with that type of behavior. So now I'm like, actually, either, either give that person the tools and let them get it done or find someone else to do it. But that means it assumes you got a good team in the first place. Correct. That they're competent. That you build that team, but if if you, if you can't, if that person can't do it, then it's it's sometimes a really hard decision to say I'm going to give it to someone else. But it's long term that's going to be a better decision. And then if that person can then build themselves back up and come up and help that person, you know, put someone else on point, let that person maybe still help, but put someone else on point, you know, can own it and deliver on it. And that person can learn along the journey, and then you can bring them back on point later on. But if it's something that's a really critical piece of the of operation, don't just leave them on point 
and let other people help them because it's it's, it's probably not going to change. And that's something that I've learned that I it, it, the I'm working through with a few of my people at the moment is um, they're really hard decisions and they're sometimes hard communication to, to have, but it actually helps everyone because the person that comes on point, work it delivers, the person that wasn't getting it done learn if you communicate with them well and you don't do it, you know, you can do it in a right way. You don't, you don't have to be rude about it or, or put them down or, or even make it visible to everyone else. There's ways that you can do things that it's going to help everyone. And they all, they all achieve together. So the whole team achieves, you know, you win a gold medal, you, you sign a deal or you create a new product. Um, and then you can go back to, okay, well, who's the best people as we go to the next evolution of building a product, selling it, whatever it is. Where does where's everyone's strengths and weaknesses now as a team as like a footy team right you said you you stay in you stay in your in your lane you do your job this is your this is your job for the for the game um, maybe your job changes slightly and you go on point for a different thing because your strengths and weaknesses are, are, are more designed to that so someone like you I would I'd, I'd like your your opinion on it or, or at least your verbalization of it someone like you has to develop unbelievably good communication skills. Um, because teamwork re requires communication, <laughs> yeah. uh, particularly you. I mean, like your teams have to communicate to you, but equally you have to communicate back to them. Correct. So what would you say is the a good definition, if you could apply it to business, yeah. um, of a good communicator relative to a team? So what does a good communicator have to have in terms of being effective relative to his or her team? Or her team? Empathy, which means means you understand your audience, you understand your people. You can live in their, you can you, you you try and live in their shoes, understand their. So when you're communicating to them, you understand why, how they want to receive information, how it's going to affect them personally, um, how, um, what 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 day it is. Is you know is are the, is their wife having a child that day? Is it a good day to send them that message? You know, because it's uh, the t the style of communication and the timing of the t of the communication are equally as important. So so tone is important. Tone's important. Language delivery timing. Is it? Do you want to do it? Is it? Is it the message should be delivered in the morning or in the afternoon? Um, don't just go. I'm going to go and do this now because it's what I want to do. Empathy. True empathy is about understanding what other people want. Uh, I think, and as a leader, if you can have that true empathy, understanding your people and your customers, um, and really live in their lens and see the world through their lens, then you will naturally communicate well because you're you're trying you're you're trying to articulate to them in a way that they will understand and will help them be the best person that they can be. Yeah, that's interesting when you say empathy, especially um, a lot of people use the word and they throw it around a lot, but empathy means actually understanding how another person is going to receive something. Correct. And uh, and that means you've got to understand all the circumstances. So that means you've got to be you know, it is a bit exhausting, like yeah. we said earlier, but you've got to actually be continually making inquiry. Correct. And be open to receiving data, mm -hmm. information about them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big deal, especially if you're running lots of different teams. Mm -hmm. How do you get through that? I, I I am genuinely keen. I like it. It's something that I'm passionate about is understanding people and, and, and being empathetic. And I think it comes back to me not being understood as a kid. So I realize how important it is to purely understand people and what their differences are um so I, I i want to do it like whenever i jump on a call i will be i'll spend the first two or three minutes saying how are you what are you doing and especially if it's one-on-one -on -one, like if you jump on a call and there's other people not there like you get rather than just going oh how's the weather how like how are your dogs how are your kids what are you doing and you, that's it's a little it's a two-minute opportunity you get but then you can come back to that three months later and go how did that? How did that thing go? What What are your challenges? You know, what I mean, if if someone in my team rings me and says, "Look, someone in my team is having this challenge at the moment," I pick the phone up and call them. Like I make it a that's an important call for me to make that day and call them one on one and say, "Like I hear you. I want to like." And that, then it might be it. it might turn into a fifteen minute call because they really they they need to to talk. But by doing that, I think I'm known as a as a leader that's empathetic and cares about my people. Um, and so they want to share information with me. So it's a two-way dialogue, right? So once you once you start that feed, um, that cycle of of showing that you truly are interested, people will actually volunteer the information. Because if you if they don't feel like you want the information, they're not gonna they're not gonna give it. So then it actually becomes exhausting because you're trying to get it somehow, but it's not actually, and it's probably not even the deep stuff that's going to help. It's just the tr that, that that high level surface layer stuff. Um, so I, I think because I truly have desire to understand people. And to lead them from a place of empathy, that I get that information volunteered to me. 
maybe your real superpower is not how good your, your ears are. Maybe your real superpower is that you map out people's lives, the people you're talking to. You map out what's important. Yeah. And uh, the only way you can do this is by being empathetic. Correct. By asking stuff or listening to stuff. And, yeah. and then and you sort of you, you position it, you put it in places. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe people who can see perfectly, maybe we take shit for granted and for we and we never have to t- tap into these superpowers. I think as well the whole visual thing is a bit of a distractor. So I've I I speak in in my in my keynotes about how I manage a boardroom. So I don't if you're in a room, right, and there's six people in a room and they're smile and most smiling and nodding. Smile fucking. Yep. Um if they're not talking, I'm like, why is there silence? Or there's, I, I, so I, I can feel energy in a room. So I will feel if there's, if you're, if there's a void of energy coming from you or negative energy coming from you, I want to talk to you because there's a problem. I want to solve that problem in the room now. I don't want to leave. So a lot of people in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sales room or a boardroom situation will talk to the people that are talking to them because that's comfortable. But those people are already bought into the solution. I, I use energy and sound and, and, and different information to go, why is that person not engaged? Why are they distracted? And let's fix the problem for them now so I don't leave the room and then they're going to go over to Tim and say, I don't like that guy. Let's get him on board. Um, so there's energy that I use, but it's also sound. You can hear the tone of someone's voice when they're speaking, whether they're interested or they don't believe you or um, they're disinterested or whatever it is, you can pick that information up. Whereas I think a lot of times the small fucking whatever it is is to really distracting people with vision so i'm i'm almost sitting there with my eyes closed just real and if you next time you're in a if you get an opportunity and you're in a room and you can just close your eyes and listen to the tone and try and feel the energy and i i for me it's people ask me how what does that mean how do you feel energy but it's almost like colors i can almost feel colors coming off people in the room and knowing what you know if it's good energy or bad energy if you close your eyes and tap into that a bit i bet you you can you can probably Learn a bit about the people you're working with that, you, that you're not using at the moment because you're seeing the, the, the small fucking. Do you think that um, uh, you use the word energy? I love that word. Yeah. Um, to me, you know, like vibrations. Yes. Voice is just vibrations. That's, Correct. And it's a form of energy. Resonance. Yeah. But do you think that people try to hide their energy out of laziness or or um, try to bluff their way through? Like if, if we're talking about board meetings or presentations. Yeah. Try to bluff their way through situations because they're either not um, engaged yeah. in the conversation, and yeah. they're just doing it because it's like a rehearsal, or they're doing it because they have to be there. Yeah. Can you? Do you think that's? Do you do you feel that? Yeah, for and, sure. And how do you deal with that? Um. So I I think that's a lot of it comes from insecurity. There's a lot of very insecure people and people that come from a place of fear and work from a place of fear. Um. I like to try and break down that fear. Just like there's no. This is a safe place, right? You know. If you deliver the job, if you deliver the best, if you deliver to whatever you're about to deliver to me, if you deliver it to the best of your abilities, I don't care if you get a few words wrong or if it's not 100%. And if you if you need to leave the room and go and get, if we don't, if you don't have all the information right now and you got to leave the room and come back with it, that's great. But if you've, if you've come in here, you haven't prepared well, you're wasting my time, I'm not going to deal with that. And that, that's, the, that's the other side to it. Like I, I'm very empathetic and we just talked about the empathy and I want to understand people. But if you're mucking around and you're wasting my time, I'm not going to be a friendly person. I'm not going to be a nice person to you. I'm not going to – the empathy goes, I understand that you're not doing your job. So I'm going to treat you with this, the disrespect that you're treating me with. You know what I mean? I'm not going to treat you with disrespect. I'm just going to call a spade a spade and say, it's not good enough. Do better next time. I'm not going to engage. Yeah, well, I'm going to engage and I'm going to tell you it's not good enough. Come back come back when you've done your job. Um, so you, you can be you can be have empathy, but you don't have to be gentle and soft. Uh, I think there's kindness and there's softness and, and that, that that that's a, that's something that's needed all the time. But just I think a lot of people go empathy. Oh, it's just about being gentle and soft, and it's not it's not all about that. It's about understanding people. But then if if it's also then if if people need to have a little knock, knock on the you know a little tap on the back to say you're not doing good enough, you need to step your game up. Then that's that's required as well. It's interesting uh, when I was listening to that answer, I closed my eyes. Yeah, and um, I just I didn't want to look at you. Yeah. And I just wanted to hear what you had to say. Yeah. I just try to do what maybe you have to do. Yeah. And um I felt like I received everything much better. Yeah, yeah. And uh and I, I it, it's it, but I also felt like I had to be sort of a bit more generous towards you. And uh maybe generosity is an important thing for disabled people. Well, my wife says I'm too I'm, I'm overly generous. Um but no, but that's a superpower. Yeah. I think, yeah, maybe it's it's. I mean, because I think what people like you have had to do, you've yeah. had to develop these superpowers, which you, we probably all have it. Yeah, maybe we 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 um, take for granted. Yeah, 
what we got and we don't need to. Well, I I truly believe that. Like um, Malcolm Gladwell out, outliers. Yep. Like he, we're all humans. You, you, we we all go. Oh, these people are amazing. They're super superhuman. But then when you look at the the life the exp- the life experience they've had has has got, brought them to that point. You know what I mean? So, um, and I think that that's a great book because it shows that we're all pretty similar. It's just that our life experience gives us different um, capacities in different areas. So I've had to develop, because of my disability, I've been given opportunities to learn, like, you know, listening and asking questions because I couldn't read or read Braille. I had to listen and ask questions. So I've become superhuman at asking questions and listening and capturing information. So it's just my life experience. Um, but I think if we all try a bit harder too, that's the other thing as well. I think I've tried really hard and I've, had a, I've worked my ass off in a lot of areas and um, it's, you know, I haven't been given the awards that I've had in life because I've just learned a few different little little tricks, you know what I mean? There's the, there's the tricks, but there's the hard work that comes with it as well. It's amazing, you know, you just reminded me of a, a friend of mine who has been a friend of mine for a long, long time, like 40, 50 years. And uh, when I first met him, um, he's about three years older than me, he's about, and he's, I was like 20 years of age or something like that. I went to a restaurant with him and uh, he, we ordered, the, you know, we, He's not blind. He, yeah. he can, you know. I, I, I met him through boxing, so you know he was. Yeah, yeah. You know, we were sparring stuff like that. Yeah, not when and, he's uh, not, not blind when he's not had too many beers. No, no, no. Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, he did like a drink. He still does. <laughs> and um and uh, and uh, but he was he, the waiter gave the menu and he looked at the menu and he said to the waiter, you know, what's everyone around, you know, like what's a special here or whatever the words were. Mm. And then I went to him over years, five years. I didn't realize he couldn't read and write. Okay. But I never knew. Yeah. Because he learned these little techniques. Yep. He would listen to what everyone else was ordering. Yep. Or he would ask the waiter, well, like, what's your special? Yeah. So what, what is, what's, what's the house special? What, is it, what, yep. are, you, what are you known for? Yeah. Yeah. And that little technique. Yeah. And uh, anybody who would be sitting with him yep. would not have known that he could not read or write. He never learned to read or write. Yeah. And he still can't really read or write yeah. to this very day. And he, yeah. today he's 70 something, yeah. 71. Yeah. And, um, but he still gets away with it yeah. because he learned techniques. So a lot of people that meet me don't know that I'm blind. Because I can walk into a room, don't use a cane. I can walk to, I've, especially if I've been there before. I know where the seats are. I know where everything is, um, and then I can do the same. I, I, you know, I've developed all those tricks and, and skills of not letting people know that I, I've got some deficiencies in some part of my life. But do, therefore, I mean, I, I know it's called disability, but yeah. sometimes we never really say these people have got more ability. No, no, different abilities. Yeah, well, okay, different abilities. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty weird thing to say. Different difabilities. Maybe yeah. we need a different word. No, no. It's no, I, I'm really passionate about saying disability. Yep. Because we all have abilities, and we've all got pretty equal opportunities in life. Okay. So you and someone else, your friend that can't read, probably have similar. He, but he potentially has a, 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 a mental disability. Yeah. That, yeah. He has, like he has a learning, learning disability. Learning yep. disability. Yep. Yeah. So like, dis- something. So, um, so you got disability. That disability actually gives him less opportunities in life than you. That's true. So let's just call in our that. current structure. In Soci- our current structure, a societal structure. Correct. So let's just call a spade a spade. Disability is disability, but despite our disabilities, we all have different abil- We all have different strengths, superpowers, as you said. Um, so, and I think a lot of the times people with disabilities have to work a lot harder. They have to go through a lot more. They have to go a lot, lot through. Uh, they, they build more resilience because their life's a lot harder. Um, and so I think when you look at uh, employment statistics, there's like. Less than fifty percent of Australians with dis- uh, have Australians with disability have a job, but then for the for the people that do, they've got like they've got I think it's six years longer tenure than their able-bodied counterparts. They take less sick days. So the people with disabilities they take less sick days on average than people that are able-bodied. Wow. So that uh, you know, but they're they're really good employers employees because they have built their problem solvers because they've had to work their way around things. They're resilient. You know, there's all these good things, but they still, to this day, they have less opportunities to get a job. Even though you, you can line all these things out and you're, you're going, wow, and it probably makes sense to you, but they still don't have the same opportunities to get jobs that they put their able-bodied counterparts to. It's funny, I was talking to Dylan, I, was, I saw Dylan Alcott do yeah. an ad on television yesterday, uh, last night, Yeah, I think it was, uh, and I actually texted him talking about uh, the representation of um, people with disabilities in relation to TV advertising. Yeah. They have such a small percentage of TV advertising. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that they should have more. Yeah. And I text them and said, mate, that makes sense. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense yeah. to me. Um, and, uh, and then they have some examples of disabled people. Yeah. And they were singing songs about Amy or something like that. I think it was yeah, yeah. Amy, the insurance company that was sponsoring yeah. this. Yeah. And I thought that, that makes sense to me. And, uh, I, I, 
again, I'm just, from my point of view, and I don't know whether I should feel this way or not, but mm. like when I sit here talking to someone like you, just like doing a Dylan, I actually feel um, quite humbled mm. um, to be able to sit down and talk to someone who who has a disability but does things even with my ability. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't try it surfing like you did. Um, I mean, I would. If someone put said put a blindfold on and ride on a bike race, I said you kidding? Um, or, or someone put a blindfold on and said to me go and go and box, fight that bloke. Yeah. Uh, you, you're joking, uh, or, or get a, get on, go and ride a hundred foot wave or something like that. Yeah. Off your head, yeah. Um, uh, so I, but you have a choice, right? Not to do it or not to do it. And so it comes down to choice, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it comes down to you not having choices, and you, but you didn't have to choose to go and ride those big waves. And that's what my dad says. You can maybe do something in the middle. You don't have to 100%. go. And, you don't have to go full. You know, do this level. But that's just. Who I am, I suppose. That's that's what I do. Well, I feel quite privileged to be able to sit in um, in in someone like yours company, but I'm probably you know the fact that you've achieved these things. But probably the most important thing I get out of this conversation from you, Matt, is the superpower of empathy that you've built hmm. and acknowledging that, and um, it makes me think about what I can do better. Hmm. And to, to a large extent, I mean, I got a son nearly your age. Um, he's only a year younger than you. Um, so people like you continually, you know, people you, your age, young person, relatively speaking, I'm talking about, relatively speaking, yeah. but with a disability, still, I still get inspired and motivated by people like you and it's pretty fucking cool. Like, uh, yeah, it's, that's one of the great things about my, my job doing a podcast is being able to meet people like you um, and I walk out of this, I walk out of this feeling much taller, much bigger, much better and, uh, and I also walk out feeling a lot more gratitude for what I've got too. You know, I often um, overlook how good it's been in 68 years. So um, thanks very much. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you. Appreciate you having me.